can, can I sorry uh, I just want to maybe at this point try to understand for everybody's uh, knowledge here to exchange the knowledge so there could be if we if we need to kind of separate the areas of the whole clinic or health service providing the whole dynamics of it one would be legal then one would be federal and state regulations state regulations then yes. the pharmaceutical aspect of yes. it and then the legal uh, the insurance mm. insurance for the for liability the as well as liability well. as well as for the malpractice malpractice and any other expertise uh, needed laboratory x-rays um, so, um, there, there, there are labs others yeah. but these are you know labs and yeah labs, x-rays and there's one oh. governance the structural um, structural setup yeah governance any other because eventually with this conversation moving forward what I am thinking, I need everybody's input here, that if we can develop the expertise on each area, if there are volunteers who can who can come forward, say that this is my area, I can provide expertise or I can provide guidance, then we can, if somebody calls us at Imana on a particular area, then we can provide, refer to them. That and, and I think one additional one, because of the you know Affordable Care Act, we don't even know what that really means, a lot of providers. In five, ten years, free clinics may be obsolete because Absolutely. everyone is supposed to get coverage. So we don't want to spend a lot of time with a model that's right. going to be obsolete in five years. Like MCC has go gone through the growing pains, and we're on the other end. We are just watching and waiting because we're just starting. You may say that, you know, a good, the brother left the sustainability and the business model in light of the Affordable Care Act. So we're really complementing and not trying to start something that is kind of flawed at the outset. But we all feel good about it, but then we're spending more money, and average cost per patient is far more than if you just let them go to a private uh, doctor. But structure is very important because this is when attorneys have to play the role here. Okay, uh, now our first and second both were saying IRS says this is a public charity after their review. It is a public charity, not for profit. Second one also public charity, not for profit. But now, no, uh, our, uh, 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 non-religious, uh, but now we are uh, we uh, we want not for profit, but uh, still uh, uh, it is not public charity. Okay. So the way the St. Luke's Methodist and Texas Children, all those, uh, they Thank developed you. in that direction. So uh, we have to go in that direction. Uh, all the way to medical schools uh, thing that is the only uh, um, uh, really um, uh, future uh, direction we have been thinking of that for the past two three years finally now after realizing that we uh, we keep keep getting into red if we run six days a week any clinic we cannot just uh, 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 continue to afford in that so direction the question here what uh, dr samir here raised is with this uh, affordable health care act uh, the the impact of it, this model you are suggesting won't affect that. Uh, this um, uh, model, uh, 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 there are hospitals based on this model, not for profit. So they cannot. <laughs> it will uh, still continue. It is the attorneys they have to uh, give us the uh, proper structure in that direction so that IRS approval is obtained. So, Dr. Samir, what do you follow up to you? Is that you raised a very important question because the future of free clinics, you know, to, to be more drastic about it, is absolutely if affordable health care act really becomes as successful as they are hoping to be. Yeah. And that's why they mentioned, you know, the term free clinic is such a misnomer. No, we but you know, there, there is nothing wrong in starting a free clinic, sort of called free clinic now. Because yeah. one of the things that happened to us at MCC is that we started that way. And the, the patients who were coming there loved the physicians, the word spread, so then people who could afford to pay were coming to the clinic. And then with the Affordable Care Act, when that fully kicks in, you will already have a captured population. And these people, once they see the type of care that you're delivering, they themselves will, will tell others, as, as, has, as happened to us, yeah. and, and you will uh, expand that way. So I don't see a problem in starting it right now. Yeah. You don't want to start too big. Start what you can afford to, to yeah. provide well, right well, now. Yeah, and I mean, we're actually starting now. Yeah. But I think the key is, 
you know, don't start too grand. Right. right. And yeah. then end up finding out, wow, we spent all this yeah. money and effort where Affordable Care Act no. really yeah. covers, you know, covers some of those yeah. So the question is, are there a step-by-step -step that you have to go through? Do you have to start with this free clinic or well, you know, the way before we, you get to your I, and I, I suppose there are many ways you can start it, but the way that we started it was on Saturdays. We started uh, just for about uh, two or three hours, once a week. Yeah. And then it gradually picked up by itself. We didn't advertise or anything of that sort. The patients who were coming there were our best advertisers. And right now we're operating six days a week. So All day long. We, we've, um, we actually registered patients to build up a population before we um, open. So we have about 100 people who have, set, who have meet our eligibility criteria. Sure. The problem now is really getting those volunteers, do, the volunteer physicians, to come in and do the work. So how do you all, you know, find volunteer? Well, I guess you're paying them yeah. now. Primary yeah. care. Yeah. Primary care. Them, but back then, this, uh, as Dr. Sufi had mentioned, this was started by a cardiologist who had retired. Okay. And he had a vision even before he retired to do this type of thing, uh, uh, Dr. Kadri. And uh, so he, he started, that's why he was started only on a weekend day. So you started small, he started with just one help, his wife. And then it gradually expanded. People saw what was happening and they started volunteering. And then as patients coming in and they started to pay, then it expanded that way. And now we're, you know, everybody's paying so just So the about. question I see is, for example, we're opening only, the ACHN is opening, opening on weekends only. Sure. Weekend, yeah. Weekends only. So once uh, already public knows about it, already our potential beneficiaries know, and they're asking us, when are you opening the clinic? So if we limit like 20 patients a week, the rest of the five days when patients are going to clamor, why don't you open, why don't you open more slots, what do you do about that? Uh, yeah, I, yeah, yeah, yeah I think uh, for years uh, we were... Uh, could not uh, go beyond Sundays or one day a week rather mm -hmm. because volunteers you need a lot of volunteers yeah, right. yeah. receptionists yeah, right. there and, and, and uh, medical assistants then physicians one day a week um, for years um, and then afterwards after about eight nine years then uh, by hiring others because on other days you cannot find volunteers right Physician, you, you will not find, yeah, you yeah. will not find. So start very small on one day only. Well, we are already kind of committed to two yeah. days. Can two I, days. Some, some of us have not spoken here. If we would like to share them if they have some information yeah. so that we can come back with. Okay. I have something to share, brother. Actually, I'm a resident physician. I'm, I'm just as you just learned, you know, <coughs> who knows why may, might find yourself in the future. But uh, it's been an enlightening session. Okay. Yeah, I'm, state. I'm a pharmacist, I'm just here to learn. Yeah, I'm a cardiologist, uh, I'm a cardiac electrophysiologist. I recently moved from Allentown, Pennsylvania to Columbia, South Carolina. In Allentown, uh, there is a sort of a very, very rudimentary type free clinic started by one of my another colleague cardiologists, whereby it is done in a couple of rooms in a mosque. And that mosque actually we bought a church, so it's a big church, in a lot of rooms, and run by volunteer, arranged by this cardiologist who would email and recruit all the volunteer yeah. physicians, and uh, um, you know, other uh, society members for the other receptionists and things like that. But that service is very limited. Physical exam and. Uh, you know, telling grossly if you have any abnormalities and, uh, you know, there's a pre-driver's license physical exam, things like that. <coughs> but I think, you know, it needs to move to a higher level as you're talking here. So in Colombia, um, uh, there is nothing like that yet, so I'm trying to explore all the possibilities. Same. Uh, I'm a nephrologist. Right. Same place. He's my brother-in-law. He just moved in to Columbia, South Carolina. <laughs> uh, we have been thinking about doing so. We have a free clinic in town. But we certainly, as a Muslim, we want to contribute something to the society. That's the reason we were thinking. But uh, uh, we have a significant amount of uh, nurses and also physicians that are willing to volunteer. But we have some difficulty getting the team together to organize it. 
uh, one of the concerns that I personally had is the liability issue more than anything else. Um, a side question is that uh, if we charge small amount of money, does that change the scope of liability? No. It doesn't change anything. No. No. And, and you, the provisions, even if the state is funding it, they allow an administrative fee. You know, and, and that's kind of uh, subjective. But one thing I'll, you know, just to counter what you're doing, because I think in Columbia, South Carolina, very different than Washington, D.C. Yeah. suburb, why don't you volunteer for the local free clinic? Yeah. Learn from them. That's the best dawah. I think we don't need yeah. to reinvent the wheel. If they yeah. have a free clinic in Columbia, yes. you've got a nephrologist and cardiologist, we, uh, we and that's are, the start. We, we have members who does it. Yeah. And then even get on their board and actually be integral, and you'll realize maybe all they need is this, and then you'll have easier partnerships. I think we have to be in the phase of trying to, again, have partnerships as opposed to reinventing the wheel. Because sure. then, you know, it's, it's tough. Healthcare right now is tough in general. Yeah, we there are limited resources. That aspect too, yeah, that alhamdulillah, uh, that's we, good. We can go and just be part of it. Whether we do that, we, we certainly have some people who are a little more enthusiastic. They want to run on their own. But I'm kind of, I go one step forward, one step backward. That's what is going on. So I'm trying to learn. Yeah, yeah. I think, Anybody, my, yeah. I think some of us here. <laughs> <laughs> uh, my name is Nahid Saif. I'm a pediatrician and I practice in Hagerstown, Maryland. Um, I have, uh, when I initially started my practice, I did volunteer in the free clinic in, in Hagerstown, yeah, which was, uh, it's still there, very well organized, and uh, they would send me a schedule every month and ask me which were the days that I'm, I'm available, and then they would put me in the schedule, and I'll go yeah. there mm. for one or two hours to, to just see patients. Um, I have also volunteered with Imana uh, for their you know, uh, missions, but today I'm here because I wanted to hear everybody else's views and what you think about the free clinic and just, just to see. Here in the back, we have somebody. Yeah, I was, you know, we, we are from Houston. I'm a cardiologist, she's a gynecologist, my wife. Yeah, she um, You know, Texas is against the Affordable Act. Um, but in D.C. and these places, you are more familiar with the act, and uh, it's going to be... They're going more. to start recruiting from October 1st, uh, here, and January 1st will be implemented. Uh, so, have you had any lectures from the government people or anybody as to how it will function? Just because you're physically next door, we're still <laughs> in as much in the dark as <laughs> Texas or California. So because, you know, they said you have to form ACOs and then that will be the primary care physicians and the specialists can be in any group, <coughs> the, only the primary care and, uh, and uh, there will be a lot of, you know, say in my Harris County we have one million people who have no insurance. So uh, one million people coming into the insurance which includes a lot of Asians, you know, you and I, we yeah. see a lot of patients who have no insurance no come to insurance. our office, we see yeah, them. That's right, yeah. We guide them, you know, somebody having chest pain, we guide them to the ER, go there, you know, don't have an MI at home and die. Yeah. yeah. You can go to any ER and we, we guide them, you know. Yeah. Of course, uh, we get patients from the free clinic, uh, referred to cardiologists from Shifa Clinic, yeah. and uh, we do their stress tests and all that either minimum charge or no charge, depending on how they are. So this is another thing, you know, just seeing the patients in the clinic is not enough. Somebody having chest pain, there will be volunteer cardiologists who will say, okay, I will see them for minimum charge or, you know, try to help them find out if it's really a cardiac problem or not. So you have other volunteers who are ready to receive those patients for follow-up later on, because you can't provide all the services. Uh, you know, GI patient needing an endoscopy or colonoscopy is having. So these are other kind of uh, who cannot come to the clinic, but they will accept the patient in their clinics and do yeah. some testing yeah. at a minimum charge or whatever. That also should be a way of looking at these free clinics. Before uh, next person speaks, uh, we have a sign up sheet here. If you want to be. Uh, part of this con ongoing conversation, please uh, print your name uh, clearly and email and phone number uh, in that uh, um, Does uh, can anyone tell us about any experience with uh, healthcare education in the public? Health 
awareness. Any center doing it? In oh, you know, we, we do that at MCC. Um, we do it in two, in two forms. Uh, number one, we will have special programs periodically uh, just for that. Then we have, every Sunday, we have uh, a lecture series. And as part of that, uh, maybe once every two months or so, we will have uh, a presentation on the health topics. And those are done not necessarily only by uh, Muslim physicians, but sometimes we get uh, the, the, the Montgomery County um, uh, medical establishment uh, for them to come in and talk to us, talk to the patients there uh, as to what their needs might be. Um, I guess someone is trying to give us a signal to, no, to get out of here. No? Okay. Um, but it's a good question that you raise. All of us know about Medicare and Medicaid. There are a lot of patients, um, and I work at Howard University Hospital where he's training right now, where we see a lot of those patients uh, uh, who are uh, Medicaid or Medicaid eligible. And I say eligible because a lot of patients who are eligible for Medicaid did not seek it. They did not get it. So the Affordable Care Act doesn't necessarily mean that patients are going to come and get treatment. And even if they do get the insurance, as some patients do have Medicare and Medicaid, they still do not follow up uh, to get their treatment, even though they don't have to pay anything. So the education of the patient is, is really of prime importance. And yeah. A lot of us are thinking that this Affordable Care Act is going to be the solution for everything, but it's not. Because there's going to, still going to be a lot of people who are going to be left there. And I tell you, from my experience, the immigrant population are very suspicious of the type of care that we provide in this country. They want to know, why, do, why can't I go, like in my country, I go see one doctor and he provides everything for me. Why do you have to send me to a lab and Five then I different. have to go to a cardiologist? And then I have to go to an interventional cardiologist, and then I have to go to a thoracic surgeon. Just want to make money off of me. Yeah. <laughs> and Can that's I make what a they comment on this too, from a different aspect about patient education? I volunteered uh, with a free clinic for three, four years, and uh, it's called Jeannie Schmidt Free Clinic, and it's going to be, it has incorporated with the Loudoun County Free Clinic, and it's called Herndon, Herndon Health Works. So their model was, and they started with the premise they only want to take care of diabetics and hypertensives. So all diabetics who were seen by us providers also saw a pharmacist, nurse educator, and a diabetologist at the same time. So they had provided patient education on the same, like a patient-centered medical home model. So everybody who uh, was eligible for care would also be seen by, by a para, uh, paramedical professionals at the same time. So which was a very good service because many of our patients were non-English speaking, many were Hispanics or uh, Arabic and Pakistani Indians. So they were provided education in people who spoke their language with, you know, with all the myths about diabetes and hypertension people had. So I think they were providing very good service. And AC, at ACHN, that's what we want to emulate. We want to have providers on site, so after a patient sees a, a provider, a medical provider, they will be able to see a paramedical provider too on the same, same visit. Yeah.